Hello my quilting friends, my name is Leah Day and welcome to episode 89 of the podcast. And today I'm going to share my word of the year. <laughs> this is something I do every year. I pick out a word and it serves as a guiding principle. Uh, it's really helping me achieve my goals more than anything else. And it's a big deal. I mean, it really, you know, it does kind of change the scope of the year and, and certainly how I think about things and uh, it affects journaling. And this particular last year of challenge has been a major game changer, I've got to say. So in this podcast episode, I'm going to talk a lot about challenge and how having that be my word of the year has been amazing and challenging and awesome all at the same time. Uh, and I want to go back through that and kind of do a little bit of self-reflection, so you're going to have to wait <laughs> just a little bit before I tell you what the word is for 2019. But really quick, first, I am super excited about our Friendship Quilt Along that we are doing together every month of 2019. And we already started. We started just a little bit earlier on this Quilt Along than usual and had a one block, two piece in December. So this is the Scrappy Star Block and I've already quilted it. This is the one that I quilted on my long arm and I got a question and you know basically it kind of went along the lines of oh well you know this was really beautifully pieced and I was expecting a much better quilting design. <laughs> you know like I'm not very impressed with just stippling over the surface. Now this one I actually quilted on my long arm and I actually found this challenging. It was challenging to advance the quilt through my long arm. I learned a lot. Uh, I feel like that was a really excellent design and it's simply quilted. It is quilted to be a bed quilt. You can see the quilting design just a little bit better on the back. Um, it's simple. It is utilitarian. It is enough quilting to hold the layers of the quilt together and to not be stiff. I don't know about you, but I don't need a cardboard feeling quilt to go on my bed and I am making a king size version of this quilt. So yeah, that's two blocks a month and they are going to be quilted simply, utilitarian. Uh, it's not gonna be crazy, dense, mega pebbled, <laughs> stitched to death quilting. Uh, you know, I'm keeping it really, you know, minimal. And we're still learning a lot. And this is still a big giant block and can be challenging to manage. This is the one that I did on my home machine. And this is quilted with straight lines, echo ditching and straight line quilting. You could do this with a walking foot. I did some of it with rulers. I did some of it with my walking foot. So, you know, my focus with this particular quilt along, with the Friendship Quilt Along, is it's meant to be a stash buster. It is meant to absolutely clean out your stash of scraps. Like if you've got a major stash of scraps and little tiny pieces, you are going to use them all up. I promise, all of them, you're gonna use them all up in this quilt. And as for the background, I've been getting a lot of questions about, you know, like it's a lot of fabric for the king size version of this quilt in the background fabric, you're gonna need something like 14 yards of background fabric. That's a lot of fabric to put into one quilt. You could be looking at, well, where do you have one yard or a half a yard or a third of a yard? Use up what you've got in your stash. I know you've got a lot of fabric hanging around. So that's the idea. The emphasis is the stash busting and cleaning out our fabric. So then maybe next year we can be thinking about what do we want to try new? What do we want to try that's different? What do we want to rebuild our stash with from scratch? Because in doing this and cleaning out my fabric completely, I was able to see all of the patterns and all of the um, kind of phases I went through. I went through a fabric dyeing phase and I went through a, you know, a very, a, obviously a print phase. I bought a lot of prints there for a while, but I didn't end up using them. You know, I went through a solid phase and I'm, I've stayed in a boutique phase for years. So it's one of those things that I think is really good. It's good to do a total clean out. That's what the Friendship Quilt Along is all about. But as with all of my quilt alongs, we also piece and we quilt it too. I'm just not going super majorly over the top with the quilting this year because again, it's meant to be a bed quilt. When I finish my king size friendship sampler quilt, I want it to be soft and cuddly and comfortable to sleep under. 
So there we go. That is the block that I quilted on my home machine. Super simple. And here is block number two. This is our second block that we're going to be piecing and quilting together in January. And this is really simple. It's actually a lot less cutting. So if you were feeling like the cutting was just over the top in block number one, don't worry. Block number two is actually quite a lot easier and faster, I got to say. Um, What's interesting about this is it's actually pieced from two new units that I don't use very often. Uh, quarter square triangles, which is this unit, and hourglass squares, which is that unit. And with all of these scrappy fabrics, they really come out really in an interesting way. And uh, you'll see two new tip videos on how to make those units. So definitely come and check those out. And you can find the block two pattern and the block one pattern, as well as all of the tutorials that I have shared so far, all linked up together at leahday.com slash friendship. So I hope that you'll join in the fun and join the friendship quilt along and learn how to piece and quilt with me every month this year. It's going to be a lot of fun. And for me, it's challenging myself to keep things simple. You know, I feel like I've gone pretty complex with the piecing. So it's challenging. The challenge for it for me is keeping the quilting simple. So that way it's still a very easy project for quilters of all skill levels. And in the end, we're going to have a wonderful bed quilt. You can make a crib, a throw, a twin, a queen, or a king. Just depends on how many scraps you want to bust out of your stash. <laughs> so that is it really for, you know, kind of the news as far as uh, new tutorials coming out and what's coming soon. I'm really focused on the friendship quilt along. Um, but really, honestly, my major focus in the last five days has been writing a new book. And I'll be honest, I kind of set everything else aside. <laughs> I just kind of carved out some space and said, this is what I'm going to do. And all I have done from pretty much Christmas Eve until today uh, has been to write. And that book that I have been writing is basically the story of uh, challenge and a lot of stories from this past year. Uh, it's been a lot. It ended up, surprisingly, I wasn't really expecting it, but it ended up being a lot of stories from my past uh, where I feel like I didn't rise the challenge or maybe I did rise the challenge. Uh, but it's been an amazing experience to write this book and then just to give myself permission just to focus on that. Um, now, that's not to say that I haven't been having a lot of fun with my family, too. I kind of fit this in, like all of those quiet times, like Josh and James might go play video games for a little while, or like last, yesterday they went down to South Carolina to get some fireworks. It's been in all of those quiet moments that I've just, you know, grabbed my iPad and sat down and, and knocked out some text. And I've been having huge word counts because it's like, it's like I've been waiting to write all this and now it's just blah, it's going all out at once. And it's been wonderful. Now, that being said, I have no idea if I'm going to publish this. Really, it's, it's been kind of, it's almost like I feel like I'm walking down Main Street naked. This is almost too personal. And I don't know, I, I, I'm not quite sure yet if this is gonna be something that I can release to the world. I kind of have to feel that out, but I'm having fun. I wanted to finish it, finish it by today. That didn't happen. It still feels like there's lots of stories that are kind of beating around in my head uh, that are needing to be told. And so I'm going to give myself permission to continue that and to fit it into my life in the same way that I have so far. And I'm not thinking this is going to end up being much longer than it already is. It's mostly just kind of sorting and um, getting everything in the right order. But that has been an amazing experience. And I kind of set this time aside for this. I knew about a month and a half ago that I really wanted this time um, after Christmas. This, this time is like, it's like my special time. <laughs> it has been for years. Uh, usually if I have a goddess quilt going, I will sit down and just quilt on that goddess quilt for hours. Uh, I consider this last 
uh, you know, five, six days of the year to be just kind of, it's like an extra bonus, you know, uh, it's the last five days. Everyone's kind of on break or on vacation from Christmas and the new year hasn't started yet. So it just feels like those extra days are just kind of a, a pocket of stillness and bonus that they don't really count. Like, so whatever you do during that time, it's extra. <laughs> At least that's my mentality about it. So I've had an amazing experience writing this book and it has been absolutely incredible. Uh, and, you know, just the level of, you know, kind of pulling down my thoughts and pulling down the lessons of this year and being able to put those into words and and honestly kind of um, wrap my brain around it more than anything else. Sometimes I feel like we learn lessons and unless we actually take a minute to digest it, we kind of lose the lesson almost. And by writing this, I really feel like I've learned something and captured something that I wouldn't have otherwise. So that's what I have been busy with. I kind of wrote a blog post on Christmas Day and was like, I'm going to be gone <laughs> for a little while and disappeared. And, and I gave myself permission to not get online and not check social media. And it has been a, a massive relief, to be completely honest. And there was a piece of me that felt pretty guilty. Like, oh my gosh, you know, I could be sharing all these pretty photos of the Friendship Quilt Along and I could be doing all these other things like marketing and, you know... And I, I kept, every time I would think about picking up my phone or getting on the computer, it was like, I felt like I was going to get sucked in and pulled away and I didn't want that to happen. And so I resisted that urge. I resisted that. I felt a little guilty, but I was kind of like, well, I set this side of time, you know, this, this time aside for this. And that's really important to me. So it was hard. And that was one of those challenges. It was a challenge to set that side, you know, time aside and to say, this is all I'm going to do and to ignore that voice in my head that kept telling me that I was doing something wrong. And I kept just saying, no, this is what I really need to be doing right now. And even if I don't publish this book that I've just written, even if that never sees the light of day, it absolutely was worth every second. And this is why, because I, I want to tell you um, kind of the thoughts that, you know, I'm pulling down and all of these stories and kind of go through the year. So 2018 was fun. It was an interesting, interesting year. And I felt like it was so necessary. The challenges that we went through, um, I feel like every single one of them was a, a great lesson. Uh, and as far as the things that I am most happy about, I am most proud of the fact that I finished and wrote and published my first fiction novel. I, I brought Mally the Maker, and uh, this is my book, Mally the Maker and the Queen and the Quilt. This is what I published in 2018. And I am still, this is like, feels like one of the best things I've ever done. And I'm still so, so proud of this book. And I worked on it almost the entire year. Uh, I was writing it up until I think, March or April, and then I was editing through until June or July. And then um, once I finished editing, I did the layout, I did the cover art, I did the illustrations on the inside, you know, so it really was an evolution with that book. And it was, it was a journey more than anything else. And it was a willingness to take the time exactly like this challenge book that I've been writing. It's a willingness to take the time. Now, the challenge that happened with Mally was that I released that book at a very similar time to when I released my Explore Walking Foot Quilting book the year before. So in 2017, I wrote Explore Walking Foot Quilting with Leah Day. I published that book. We had a big pre-order. We had a big launch and we sold a lot of copies. And this is the thing. It's a double-edged sword. Um, it was a double-edged sword to have that experience almost a year before and then to release Mally kind of almost not really I wasn't expecting the same thing but at the same time I'd had that experience so you can't help but compare and so then when Mally came out and I'll be honest, it hasn't sold as well. I mean, most people associate me with free motion quilting or quilting on your home sewing machine or, you know, that kind of thing. Like that's what I'm associated with. I'm associated with how to quilt 
on a machine. I'm associated with nonfiction, you know, <laughs> with how-to books more than anything else. So coming out with a fiction novel, it's so funny. Whenever I hand this to somebody, <laughs> they kind of they give it a look like it's a snake or something. I am not kidding, especially a friend. Like I, um, I went to a quilt shop where I know the quilt store owner. Uh, I like her a lot of bike machines there before. And I brought her a copy of the book and I handed it to her and she kind of looked at it like, it had uh, like it had grown two heads or something. It was really funny, and she flipped through it, and the the response is always the same. Like, wow, it's like words. <laughs> it's, it is the strangest reaction, but it is really really funny because it's not what I'm known for, and I and I think that that's kind of a problem. That it seems to come out of left field, maybe. Uh, and that's the thing. I gave myself permission to come out of left field to do something totally weird. I mean, if if I wanted a guarantee 100% that I'm going to sell a thousand copies of something, I'll go and write another how to quilt book, you know, and I and yeah, I can do that. And yeah, I plan to do more of that. But I kind of also feel like it's important to do the weird thing, the thing that's been beaten around in my head and begging to be made. And I first came up with the idea for Mally the Maker when James was in kindergarten. Uh, I was walking, I would drop him off at the bus stop and I would walk uh, around the mall and this idea kind of popped into my head and I started just talking to myself as I walked and coming up with these characters and stuff. and. Uh, it took a long time. It was an evolution. You know, I, at first I had no plot. <laughs> there was no conflict in the story whatsoever. And it took years and it took uh, a willingness to learn. It took taking classes on writing before I was ready to actually start Mally the Maker. And I'm so happy that I did, even though I get that weird reaction. And even though in the launch it did not do as well, I'm still thrilled that I took the time to do that and made that book a reality. Um, I have been working on book two and I started that as soon as I pretty much had like the, the wrap up of Mally the Maker book one, I started book two. But I'll be honest, I have I have hit some some struggles with book two. It's actually been harder to write than book number one. And I'm giving myself permission to take a break on it right now because a uh, combination of two things, writing the challenge book uh, number one, I knew right then I was going to set Mally the Maker aside, the, the second book I was going to set that book aside and focus on this challenge book for this pocket of time and then I'd get back to Mally. That's what I planned on. But in writing that challenge book, I unearthed a much deeper need that I have and that is to write my goddess book. And that book is going to be kind of a, another strange book. It's going to be part memoir, uh, part self-help, <laughs> part pretty quilt book with lots of pretty quilt pictures in it. Uh, it's going to be all of that and more. And I have had the urge to write this book for years. I have been writing journal entries for years that say, I really want to focus on my goddesses. I really want to tell those stories. I really want to write that book. I have been writing essentially the same journal entry four years and I'm done. I'm tired of it. It can't happen. I can't keep living with this thing bouncing around in my head saying, make me, make me, make me, because what's the point? It's driving me crazy, number one. And then number two, why am I denying the thing that I need to make the most? You know, the thing that keeps cropping up in journal entries and, you know, that keeps registering and ra wait, raising its hand and waving it around in the air and saying, please make me, please make time for me. And I keep saying, you know, basically kind of saying, oh, not yet. You know, it's not the right time or this is more important. And I keep making these excuses and I can't keep doing that anymore. And the reason why I can't keep doing this anymore, there's two reasons and they came up this year and kind of smack me in the head. And it was like, this was the lesson that challenge needed to teach me. Having challenge me, my word of the year was challenging in the sense of, um, it forced me to recognize some of the things that I was doing and some of the ways that I was living my life 
that was never going to be helpful for reaching my goals, you know? So playing video games, you know, it's basically hanging out in a digital world. It means nothing. It has absolutely no bearing on reality. And while yes, I enjoy it. And yes, it, you know, it's fun to do with James and it's fun to hang out with Josh and, you know, all of those things are good things. I'd rather do something physical. Like we got a ping pong set. It's like a table tennis set that you can put on your dining room table. And I had actually seen a picture of this on uh, Stephanie Modern Society. She's a, another podcast. Uh, and she had one of these sets and her she wrote something about her family liking it. And I was like, I am gonna get us a table tennis set. And so that was our best Christmas present this year was a table tennis set. So that is what I'd rather do. I would rather play ping pong with my son than play virtual ping pong or virtual tennis on the Nintendo Switch. You know, I, I think James was a little disappointed because he wanted that game for Christmas and I didn't get it for him because I thought about it. I was like, I have a choice here. I can go get a real ping pong set and we can actually learn how to play ping pong together or I can get the video game and we can learn how to punch some buttons on a controller. And if I sound just a little bit negative about that, it's because I've been playing video games my whole life, you know, and I loved them. They were great. They were fun. But I've reached a point where I have to say, that's enough. I don't want to reach level 20. It doesn't mean anything. I don't want to get all the gold stars. It doesn't mean anything. It's not getting me anywhere closer to my goals, you know? One of the most important things for me this year was bringing Miss Bunny to life. Uh, this is a doll that I remembered. I, I was given a Miss Bunny doll when I was four. So I know that this was probably a pretty popular pattern in the 80s. I lost my Miss Bunny doll. I tried to find whatever pattern people were using to make that doll. I could never find it. So I made my own. And this is just basically from memory. I remember the size of her body and her hair and or her, uh, her ears and her dress. And I basically just tried to recreate her from my memory of the size and shape of that doll. And Miss Bunny is a character in Mally the Maker. So it was like I was making something that had meant so much to me. I made her not only a new personality and I made her a real character in the book, but I also made her again. This is real, tangible stuff. This is reality. This is not virtual reality. This is not level 20. This is not five gold stars. This is a real, tangible thing. And I'm so proud of this, you know? And it's like tapping into that, I have decided that I will never play video games again unless I'm just so dog sick, I cannot even and honestly, if I'm that dog sick, I really shouldn't even be playing video games. <laughs> if I'm so dog sick, I can't get out of bed, then I should just be sleeping. So no, I really am gonna say, I don't wanna play video games anymore. I don't wanna spend my time doing that because you know, if I'm doing that, that's all I'm doing. And then I start getting obsessed with it. And no matter if it's only 30 minutes out of my day, that's 30 minutes I'm not spending doing that little extra work that could be required to finish something amazing. So yeah, it's the difference of, you know, having that 30 minutes to spend on something real and making something that really exists or spending that 30 minutes in a virtual reality, getting to the next level. But what does any of that actually mean? So the second reason why I've decided that the guys book has got to get out of me <laughs> this year is because it's so easy to think that we have a limitless amount of time. And it is so easy to run around with that idea that, you know, there's always time, there's always next year, there's always next week, there's always next month. Two very important people in my life got cancer this year and watching them and trying to be helpful, trying to be supportive, you know, it, at the same time, I could not help but see the cautionary tale in waiting because we never know how long we're going to have. Uh, I don't know how long I'm going to live. 
I could get sick, I could get cancer, I could get any number of health problems. And continuing to put something off for later, you know, that one day, one day, one day thing that I was talking about in the podcast two weeks ago, where, you know, we save things like, oh, well, one day I get to use this pretty fabric. And one day I get to make that pretty quilt. And one day I get to write that awesome book. And then we run out of days, you know. So uh, thankfully, the two people in my life that got cancer are both uh, great. They got through it. Uh, health is good. So, uh, you know, that's been good. It's been, it's very hard to know what to do when someone, you know, is sick. And I struggled with that for a bit. And, um, one person was a really good friend of mine and I thought about it and I debated is like, you know, she's, she didn't, she does, she's very introverted and she didn't really want a lot of, um, you know, people coming over and, and trying to wait on her hand and foot. That's not her style. And I thought about it and I can, I remembered, um, something I'd watched a long time ago that a woman had cured herself by laughter, that she had just watched funny videos and funny TV shows and just sat on the couch and laughed. And I thought, you know what? I can't do anything. You know, my friend wants her space and wants to just be with her family. And that's great. That's, I want to support her in any way I can, but maybe I can help her laugh and find the humor in this. So I started sending her really silly memes. I mean, completely, <laughs> completely silly stuff on Pinterest. I just sent her a Pinterest image and I, you know, text her with like two or three at a time. And, you know, sometimes she responded, sometimes she didn't. I think it lightened her load. She thanked me for it several times. Just, you know, it was a way of letting her know that I loved her and I was thinking about her. But, um, you know, I also didn't want to add any more weight to her already heavy situation. And I think, I think working through most things with laughter is a really good way of working through it. And it's been something that I've been trying to do a lot more of is just find the humor in any particular situation. And, uh, yeah, that was how I ended up working through that, I found the challenge. The challenge I think oftentimes is like, we don't know what to say and you don't want to say the wrong thing and you don't want to be offensive. But at the same time, you know, life goes on and you know, things are happening. And, and I had to just decide, I'm not going to worry about saying the wrong thing. I'm going to be there for my friend. I read a book once and that was kind of a guiding light for me with this whole situation. What in the book was a year of yes. I think that was the name of it. Anyway, it was a book about a woman's, you know, life and, and she got cancer and uh, she decided to continue keeping the word yes as her word of the year, even though she got cancer and she was really sick. And she tried more than anything else to find the humor in any situation. And at the end of that whole situation, um, once she was cured, she felt like the scars that she had were not just on her body, but also from all of the friends that had really let her down. That all of the people that had failed her by not getting in touch with her, by not staying in contact, by not, you know, just, it was almost like they thought her cancer was contagious and would infect them too. So I remembered that. I read that book several years ago and it was just something that really stuck with me and I felt like it was really important to not pull back and not be afraid of saying the wrong thing. I mean, sure, I can say the wrong thing. Yeah, so what? You know, that's what an apology is for. Like, oops, I'm sorry, that was probably, you know, like a not cool joke or whatever. Who cares? You know, at least it's trying and staying in contact. So yeah, that was something that happened right at the beginning of last year, almost as soon as I, you know, shared that my word of the year was challenge, I found out about my friend's sickness and that was tough. And it took me, it took me a few days to kind of wrap my brain around it. And what was kind of strange coincidence about the whole thing is I had a quilt on the long arm for her and, you know, wanted to give her this nice quilt and I had made it for her. And it was one of the first big things that I quilted on the long arm. And, kind of had, had stayed up late binding it the night before and then sent her a text like, hey, let's go to lunch or whatever. And then she texted me back and said, no, I'm not really feeling it. And then emailed me with the explanation of what was going on. And 
I ended up just dropping the quilt off on her front porch and just left it there. And then uh, instead of working that day, this is the thing I remember most about it was I, I had planned to work all day. I had planned to just, you know, be on the computer or shooting videos or something like that and just be working and get ahead on work because that's always a you know, fun thing to do. Uh, I like being ahead. I don't like being behind. Once I got that email from her, it really made me stop and think about what was the most important thing for me to be doing. And I realized it wasn't getting ahead on work. It was spending time with my family. So I dropped that quilt off on our front steps and then Josh and James and I went to the land and went on a walk. And that was excellent. And we did that a lot this time last year. Right now it's just a little bit too wet, we get stuck. But um, it's just, you know it was, it was a, a day that I could have spent doing one thing and instead I spent it doing something entirely different and I felt so happy that I did. And it was just, it was in making those little adjustments and those little choices that I feel like the word challenge really guided me a lot through this year where it was, it was, you know, it was kind of, it's always kind of trying to guide me towards seeing that, you know, getting all this work done or, you know, accomplishing this thing is not always the most important thing to do. You know, it's the journey. It's not the end result, basically. And, uh, you know, and that was, that went a little bit into my journey of editing Mally the Maker. Uh, as I edited, I crocheted this sweater <laughs> and I'm wearing it today. This is my crazy freeform crochet sweater that if you watch the blog, uh, sorry, if you watch the podcast videos, through the summer, which was quite a few podcast episodes, then you got to see this kind of start to finish. You know, I, I started on some medallions. I started putting them together around, I think that was around in May, and then went through the fall and, you know, put it all together. And here is the back. I love my big, there's a big giant sunshine on the back and it is all bright, crazy colors in orange and red and yellow took way more balls of yarn than I ever could have imagined, but I am so happy with it. And yeah, the, the process of editing, I was listening and editing at the same time and crocheting. So, you know, it, it, that was so much of that edit process for Mally the Maker was the journey and also making this. And I think all of that together just made it that much better. If I had sat down and just tried to line edit myself, you know, reading the words on the page and, and not working that into my life the way that I did, I think the book would have turned out very differently. I don't think I would have changed certain things that I ended up changing. So it's allowing things to evolve. And it's, I think, also allowing myself to take a little bit more time more than anything else. Another thing that I have been thinking about a lot when it comes to challenge and pursuing the work that I want to do and the quilts that I want to write about and all of that kind of stuff, you know, basically I kind of think about that as pursuing a higher goal or my ultimate priority. And I shared this a couple of weeks ago, like you can only have one priority, not priorities. Priority was never plural until the 19th century. And, and then at some point, somebody decided that we should be able to have more than one at a time. It's insane. We can only really focus on one thing at a time. And, uh, you know, I've been working on this a lot. And more than anything else, what I've discovered is basically saying no even to stuff that I want to do. And I know that's hard. I, it's, it's so, so hard. <laughs> uh, I mean, this time last year, I was making a new quilt with every single quilty box. Uh, I was getting the fabric. I was planning the quilt. I was writing the quilt pattern. You know, dad and I were prepping it and working block by block so then I could shoot the videos and knock it out in less than about five to seven days. It was a huge amount of work. And I reached about, mm, I'd say middle of the spring and a couple different things happened that weren't a lot of fun. And it just made me pull back and ask a question and go, wait a minute, am I doing this for me? You know, is this really like 
the best I can do? And is this my highest priority? And I had to answer honestly, and it was no. You know, Quilty Box, I love them, they're great. It's a lot of fun to get a box of quilting gear and beautiful fabrics, but those are not my fabrics. You know, this is designer, you know, many, many different designers' fabrics. And I will be completely honest, sometimes I really don't like that fabric. <laughs> you know, it's not my thing. And that's okay. It was a challenge to me for the two years that I did Quilty Box to take the fabric and make something out of it, no matter what I thought about it. You know, it was a challenge to push myself out of my comfort zone. And it was also a challenge to force myself to write something simple to streamline that process, to go from beginning to end in five days or less, and to not get obsessive compulsive about every single little detail. Like in years past, I've struggled with certain quilt patterns and it over nothing more than, oh, the math fabric calculation doesn't come out exactly right. Like who cares, Leah? You know, so I feel like the purpose of Quilty Box served itself. I learned how to write patterns a lot faster. I learned how to streamline that process and be a lot less emotional about pattern writing. So I got, I got the good stuff. I got what I needed out of it. And then continuing to do that, it was ending up being, that was 90% of what I was uh, producing every month and spending my time on every month and dad too, you know, so that was what we were consuming, what was basically consuming all of our time. And, you know, I have to stop and think, is that free quilt pattern the best I can do? Is that tutorial the best I can do? And those tutorials are super popular, you know? So it's really hard for me to say, I'm not gonna do that anymore, you know, or I'm gonna do something slightly different or whatever. But I, I think more than anything else I've learned is I've gotta make the harder choice if that's gonna lead me closer towards what I really wanna do with my life. You know, there is a million things that you can do in the quilting world. And I have said this to multiple friends over the years, and that is you have got to narrow your focus or the quilting world, any world, any industry in general can chew you up and spit you back out again. You know, it's too much. If you try and say yes to everything, you're gonna end up saying yes to everything and you're gonna end up burning out. It's gonna kill you. Um, there's no way that you can do all of it. And even, even the little bit that I feel like I do sometimes can feel like too much. So this was something I asked a couple weeks ago in Sue Griffith's podcast about, do you still read quilting blogs? And I got a lot of response from that. A lot of people say that they still like to read. A lot of people say they don't watch videos. A lot of people say they don't watch podcasts or listen to podcasts at all. You know, so it's really interesting. I feel like you know, if I continue doing everything, obviously I'm going to continue helping everyone in all of these different areas. Um, and it's, it's not like I'm saying that I can't continue to do everything. It's just, it's starting to feel like, um, each of these individual things is being valued less and less. And I have to just keep an eye on that. And I have to, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it's difficult to put this into words because I'm still wrapping my, my brain around it. Um, and what I come back to is, you know, what do I still buy? What am I still interested in? What do I still invest in? And, you know, the best example I have is, you know, when I run across somebody and I like their stuff and I, you know, I like that recipe that I got from that person and it turned out good. And, you know, I like the concept, maybe, uh, there's something about them that I find particularly interesting. If they have a cookbook, I will usually go and buy it. And this is why I feel like it's so important for me to take the time to write that goddess book because that has been something that I've wanted to do for years. And it's not necessarily that I want to write it so much that I think it will sell. It's that it's a, something that I think really reflects me and I'd like to put it out there. So that's something I'm thinking about a little bit of behind the scenes thing that's really early days. I can't really tell you very much about it, but we are working on potentially doing kind of a membership kind of club kind of thing. And this is going to be like a, the Facebook groups that we had where you can share pictures and interact and make friends and all that good stuff. It will not be on Facebook. 
I don't want to have anything to do with that platform anymore if I can help it. And this will be uh, on its own new platform, a whole new thing. And it will not be free, though. That's the one thing. Um, this will be a club where, you know, it's like two, three bucks a month, something like that. And that helps to support us. And also, I think putting, making it paid will keep a lot of the nasty out. <laughs> I'll be completely honest. We spent so much time on those Facebook groups just trying to get people to be nice to each other. And I think by charging two bucks a month and, you know, and saying, hey, you know, you got to buy in, that is setting a little bit of a boundary and, and, and kind of the person that I want joining this group. So like I said, way early days on that, still investigating, still planning that out. Uh, and the way you kind of want to think about that too is, you know, it's like supporting the podcast and, you know, um, helping, helping me to continue whatever we're doing, whether it is tutorials or you like the blog posts or you like the podcast, you know, um, and many times I have signed up and, and been, become a patron or, or joined a membership site just simply to help that person continue doing what they're doing. Um, it was the idea that I, I shared a couple weeks ago about just a card. You know, when you find an artist that you like and they offer cards, we're buying just a card helps to support them and keep them doing what they're doing. You might not be able to afford a whole painting or something bigger from them, but you know, buying just a card is that one small step in that direction. So yeah, early days there, still, still doing quite a lot of finagling and, and seeing if we want to do this and if this is the direction that we need to move in because things are changing. <laughs> And that is bringing me into the word of the year for 2019. So yes, lots happened in 2018. As you can see, I, uh, I really started digging into my goals and the things that I really want to do, the things that are really important to me. And I feel like I have spent a year kind of cleaning out my closets and making more space and more time for the things that I really value. And the thing more than anything else right now is writing. I will be completely honest. I love writing. I feel like I am really good at it, um, which is surprising to me. <laughs> I feel like I am actually pretty good at it. Uh, even more than that is book narration, which has also kind of a surprised, I, I was, I knew I loved to read out loud. And I, I have, I've always loved that since I was a little kid. I love to read out loud and I love to be read too, but I didn't realize just how passionate I am about that until I started narrating Mally the Maker. And I finally have all my audio equipment, all my decks in the row, and I'm going to start the actual official book narration for Mally the Maker in January or February. So that's really exciting. Uh, and yeah, so that will be available as an audiobook as well. So it's kind of like, I feel like I've unearthed some hidden talents here. Uh, and I want to continue that. Uh, now, one big thing that I shared last year that was, that was a major challenge of 2018 was my diet. And I went on Whole30, uh, I stopped eating bread and so many other things. I can pretty much say Whole30 is uh, you can eat meat and vegetables and a few fruits and some nuts. And that's pretty much it. You know, it is a very limited diet. And I'll be honest, the main reason that I went on that diet is because of some not, well, I mean, I got to say they were seemingly nice YouTube comments, um, seemingly nice, you know, I'll put it this way. It is never a nice thing to congratulate a woman on being pregnant unless you know that she's pregnant. And yeah, I was getting some comments along those lines throughout 2017 and even 2018 and it's just my body type. I mean, I can have one or two extra pounds on my body and it's gonna be right there on my belly. That's just where it's gonna hang out. Uh, and I, you know, it started, started getting my back up more than anything else. And uh, so did Whole30, slimmed down, started exercising, um, didn't end up staying on Whole30. I really like 
you know, I really like healthy fats a lot. I love bacon. So I kind of switched to keto and that's pretty much where I've maintained. Uh, and I've maintained my weight, you know, so I slimmed down and then I've maintained a nice, healthy, steady weight for more than half the year. And I love that. I love not yo-yoing. I love not having to worry about it. Um, I love still being able to eat some sugary sweets that I, I learned how to make with keto. I pretty much just use a sugar substitute now, which is Swerve. Um, and that has sorted all of that out for me. Um, and in that process, I stopped using food for comfort. I stopped using food to help me relax. You know, like two years ago, I would have gone and gotten a, you know, a drink. Um, you know, 2017, I stopped drinking. Uh, 2018, I stopped eating sugar. <laughs> so, you know, over these last two years, I have had to force myself to stop using food as my comfort blanket. And that has been a really, really big deal. But I can say through all this experience, coming out at the end of it, I still have a belly. <laughs> you know, it's really frustrating to lose like 10 to 12 pounds and still find that I've got just like this little belly and it's not gonna go away. That is not gonna go away unless I want to be at the gym working out for an hour every day or do 200 crunches or whatever. That is just part of my body type. I can't do anything about it. So rising to that challenge is to say, I lost the weight, I went through all of that stuff, and now I realize I actually a better thing to do would just be to redesign some of my clothes, like not wear shirts that emphasize that part of me. <laughs> so it's silly. I know it's silly. And I know it's silly to be so sensitive about that. But, you know, it is hard to be in videos and, you know, and, and consciously be looking at that like, oh, am I standing at the wrong angle? You know, do I need to angle myself differently? Do I need to put on some scarves? or a vest or something to hide. And in the summertime, the only time I really get comments about that, guys, is through the summertime. You know, because it's hot and I'm wearing a t-shirt and, and that's it. So yeah, I got my back up a little bit, kind of worked it all out, but I'm so happy that I went on that diet. I'm so happy that I did Whole30. I'm so happy that I did keto because it taught me a lot about how I was using food in really negative ways. And it forced me to start learning how to relax just by relaxing. Uh, so I have started taking a lot more baths in the evening, enjoying a nice book to read. Uh, a lot of times in the middle of the afternoon, if I'm feeling stressed out or just kind of, you know, I just need to relax, I'll heat up a wet washcloth, I'll put that on my eyes, lay down on the couch. That is like absolute bliss. Anything can be going on. And I do that and it totally chills me out. Uh, so all of that has been really, really good. I've also just identified the foods that I eat too that really ratchet up my anxiety and really make me feel upset. Just I eat that food and I'm ready to kill somebody and to stop eating those foods, you know? Uh, that's been really, really helpful as well. And I'd say any elimination diet is worth the time, it's worth the pain, it's worth the difficulty because it's gonna teach you so much about how you're dealing with food, the things that are really impacting you and then how you feel whenever you eat any particular thing. So it's all good, but yeah, body type is what a body type is. And now I get the challenge of designing some shirts that you know hide or you know, wrinkle nicely <laughs> over my belly and not worry about it anymore. And then now I can get into why I'm really not going to worry about it at all for at least the next two years. And that is because, drum roll, <laughs> Josh and I are trying to have another kid. I know. It's kind of, I'm still wrapping my brain around this, guys. I will be completely honest. Um... This is pretty big. So it started in October, November. Yeah, well, actually more September, October. Josh made it like an offhand comment. And I'll be honest, when James was little, like up until he was like four or five, I would periodically be like, let's have another kid. You know, like about every couple of months or so. And Josh would be like, eh, 
give it a couple weeks and let's see if you're still saying that. Josh didn't really want to have more children. Um, there's a lot behind that. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that we didn't feel like we could afford having more than one child. Uh, some of it had to do with James's birth, which was scary and crazy. And, you know, I don't think Josh wanted to go through that again. Um, but I pointed out a couple years ago that we're a lot older and smarter. <laughs> and, you know, all of those struggles that we had in 2007 weren't necessarily going to be the struggles that we could have now. And it was not really something that, um, you know, I was, I'm, I've not been like baby crazy or anything like that. It was just something that I just pointed out or mentioned. And then I said something to Josh about it in September, October, and he was like, you know what? You're right. Why don't we have another kid? And it's like he opened a door that I didn't think could open again. And almost immediately, it was like, really? <laughs> we gonna have another baby? <gasps> yeah, so first off, I'm not pregnant yet. So don't go congratulating me quite yet this second, but um, we're trying, we'll put it that way, we're trying. And I'll be honest, it is terrifying to share this because anything could happen. I don't know if I'll be able to have another baby. I'm 35 years old. Um, I, you know, it was certainly super, super easy in my 20s to get pregnant with James, but I don't know. I, like I said, I am 12 years older, which just sounds insane. I think when James hit like eight or nine, I was like, oh no, it's over now. I'm never going to have kids that are this far, far apart. Like I had in my head that I would never have kids that had a, a great big age gap. And, uh, and I, and I remember my sister just recently had a baby about two years ago and I kind of was like mind blown. Oh my gosh, James will be 20 when, you know, my nephew is 10 and that just made my head kind of explode slightly. And now I'm kind of going, wow, if I have a kid this year, I'm going to have one day down the road, I'm going to have a 22 year old and a 10 year old. <sighs> that seems a little nuts, but at the same time, it also seems perfectly okay. Um, I, here's the thing. I wanted to have James when I was in my twenties. That was, it was, it was like, I had wanted to have him for so long. Uh, it was, it was just, it was like, um, it was like just beating through my whole body. It was a big, big thing. Um, and then, you know, having James and starting this family and we, you know, it was kind of like everything happened at once. We got the house, we moved, we had the baby, you know, everything in our lives changed so rapidly. And then now we pretty much had the same life for the last 12 years and everything settled down and um, all of the craziness that happened whenever I became a mother, you know, I wasn't expecting to become this whole different person. But the second that I had James, all of a sudden, I was not just a, a woman anymore. I was not just the girl I'd been since I grew up. I was a mom. And I it was like, my common thing that I would say back then was aliens are in my brain and they are messing with my wiring. Because I just, I felt like I couldn't think. I felt like, I just felt like I was just totally different. I was just a totally different human being. And now it's not a big deal. I've been a mom for 12 years you know, I could absolutely do that again. Now, is it going to be easy? No, <laughs> it's the opposite of easy. This is the ultimate rising to the challenge. You know, this is the ultimate challenge to want to be taking on at 35 years old, but I'm super excited about it. It's scary to share this and it's scary to put that this out there because, you know, it might not happen. And I'm at the point where I can say, I'm okay if it doesn't happen. I'm happy with the life that I have. I love the life that I have. I feel like we've got something really awesome going on. But when I stop and ask the question, what am I looking forward to? That's when I know I really, really want to have more kids. Maybe not just one, maybe more than one. Because I'm looking forward to my son growing up and leaving and my dad getting older and needing to take care of him. And I don't see wanting to change my life or my lifestyle. 
You know, I don't want to raise my son and then get on the road and start traveling. That's not what makes me happy. I am happiest at home. I am happiest here doing what I do. I'm happiest when I'm writing. I'm happiest when I'm sharing tutorials and teaching and uh, making dinner with Josh every evening and just simply living our lives and raising our family. So when I think about it like that, why not? Why not have more kids? Why not continue this whole thing and start another <laughs> generation? I guess they would be in different generations between James and the, you know, a new kid that we get now. I don't know. So yeah, like I said, I am, I am, this is, this really does feel like a door that I shut and I, I had it nailed shut. I thought this was over for us. I did not think we would ever have more kids. And it's like that has been blasted open wide. And now that is what I'm thinking about every day. And that is what I'm focused on every day. And that is what I am super excited about every day. Through the month of December, I was very distracted. And <laughs> a lot of times I was like, I don't really feel like as motivated as I would normally feel during this time. You know, I, just, I, I was kind of reflecting on that. Like, huh, why am I not you know, gunning, ready to go, getting ready for the new year, all that kind of stuff. And I thought about it, I was like, well, it's because my priorities have shifted. Instead of just focused and single-minded about the business, I'm now wanting to create a new human being too. So of course, that's now two things that I'm kind of juggling, you know, two things that are on my mind. So that is what I'm hoping for in 2019. And now for the word of the year, and that is embrace change. And I want to take these two words separately first. Number one, embrace. <laughs> I want more hugs. I got to say, I really want more hugs. James has just reached this age and it's really only gotten bad in like the last month. He doesn't want to be hugged. He doesn't even let me tousle his hair. You know, like he just won't have it anymore. We are, we are in a no touching situation. You know, I can say, go comb your hair. And that's about as much as I can do. And it's breaking my heart. It really is. So I want more hugs. That would make me feel good. I'm getting them from Josh. Josh has given me a lot more hugs now because he knows it breaks my heart. Um, that James is just not having it and that's okay. You know, he's 11, he's almost 12. This is what he's supposed to do. And, and I, in, in one way, it breaks my heart, but in another way, it makes me so happy he is who he is and he has the independence to be his own person. Uh, and I just absolutely love everything about this guy. Um, but I saw my sister with her baby and he's two now. And uh, he had got hurt, like bumped his head or something. And he ran right over to her and just, you know, wrapped his arms around her and snuggled in. And it was that, I absolutely love you when you are the only person that can fix this for me kind of hug, you know, that. And I was just like, that's what I want again. I would really, really love that again. So embrace. And change can really be, you know, anything, but you know, want to think about dollars and cents, some change, you know, there's that. Um, you know, I am looking at some ways of, you know, just tiny little things that we can do. Um, you know, like the, the idea that we have for the little group, you know, for a membership group where it's not a lot of cash out, you know, it's a couple dollars and cents, it's some change and that will help support us. And then the two words together embrace change. I want my life to change. I want to make space for this new person that I'm going to have. I need to embrace the change that's going to happen to my body. <laughs> and that's going to happen in my house because I'm going to have to lose one of my, my upstairs office. I'm going to have to lose that. That will be the new baby's room. So embracing change is making space and being open and being willing and um, leaning into it, not holding back. I think so often in my life, change has hurt and been scary and painful because I've 
been resisting it and really locked up tight and struggling against that change. So being willing to embrace the change is opening your heart and cracking it open as wide as it can get and saying, welcome it in, just let it happen. But I can also say I'm not letting go of the word challenge either because that word has been so amazingly awesome. It helps me to tap into that at any given situation. If I'm sitting on the couch and the guys are doing something and I feel like I get that itchy feeling in the back of my mind, like I might want to go hang out with them. Just checking in, like, what is the challenge of this situation? What am I doing right now that I could be doing that would make me happier? And that sometimes means get up off the couch, stop writing, go check in with them, go have some fun, go play some ping pong. You know, it's been good. So I'm not letting go of the word challenge, but I am also adding the words embrace change to my life. So that is it. <laughs> that is the big word of the year for 2019 and our plans and hopes and dreams for 2019. It feels pretty huge. Not something I was expecting at all. If you had told me in 2017 or the beginning of 2018 that we would be talking about having another kid, uh, I, I would have shaken my head and laughed at you. It would have been like, what? <laughs> we closed that door. That door's been shut. And this is the reason why I feel like it's so important to say this out loud and to share this because I don't ever want anyone to think that this new baby is a mistake. You know, this is planned. You know, Josh and I are trying. So this is not, and James wasn't a mistake. I wanted that baby for more than a year before I got him. Uh, and the wide space between these kids, I know that a lot of people are going to kind of go, what, you know, why are you doing that? And women can be judgy for any number of reasons. You know, you get judged for having your t kids too close apart. You get judged for having your kids too close together. Um, you know, sorry, far apart and close together. You get judged no matter what you do. Um, I, I don't think it matters. And I never would have expected that I'd want this at this point. But now that I'm open to it, I'm absolutely in love with this idea. Uh, and just to say that I think I was blocking off and, and kind of almost, yeah, blocking is really the best word for it. I was blocking off a whole chunk of myself and my creativity by not being open to this. Um, when I sat down to draw that goddess quilt, here's a picture of it. I designed this in like five minutes. I have not designed a goddess quilt this easily with this as fluid a design process as I have this goddess. You know, it's been years since something flowed that easily for me. So, that right there told me that there has been something deep inside that has been wanting this for quite some time and I'm just now willing to listen to it. And I feel so extremely, extremely thankful for Josh and even thankful for James because shockingly enough, James is really excited about this too. He's totally making fun of us every chance that he gets because he's almost 12. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we're having a good time. We are. And I think this is going to be such an amazing, positive change. And I'm excited to see where the future goes. Like I said, if I can't get pregnant, if this doesn't happen, that's not the end of the world. I'm putting out my desire. I'm putting it out here. And I'm sharing this because I think I would explode <laughs> if I did. <laughs> I want this so bad and I want, I guess I want the desire on record. Um, one of James's classmates actually has a new baby sister this year and I, I saw his mom and uh, the baby at uh, an event for school and I asked her, I was like, how has it been? She's like, it's actually been amazing. Uh, the baby started crying that day and her 11 year old son picked her up first. Like she got to her first before she really started crying. So it's like seeing, you know, her son be a caregiver has been, you know, it's been like a whole other dimension to that child. And that, that sounds amazing. And the fact that James is so excited about this too is also amazing to me. Now, I don't know how long that will last because <laughs> we're getting into the teenage years, but 
you know, I'll take what I can get. And I'm just looking forward to hugs and sweetness. I'm looking forward to the change. I know that this will be challenging. Trust me, I know that I am going into some pretty tough stuff and some hard years and a lot, a lot of work. Um, but I'm really excited about it. What's really interesting, the goddess quilt that I finished this year was um, Dream Goddess. And when I designed this quilt, and for years, it, you know, it has represented to me um, choosing the life, dreaming of the life that you want and making it happen, taking the steps to make it happen. I have this quilt hanging up in the living room now, and it means something very different to me now that I opened to this, um, I'm open to this idea of having more children. And yeah, I look at this quilt now and I just think of having a bigger family and, you know, the potential, you know, who are these new people? And it's kind of been one of those funny things, you know, when, with James, I didn't know what I was getting into with a baby. You know, I really didn't have a lot of experience with kids before I had James. And now I, you know, I know what to expect. I've had, I've gone through all of this years before and we were driving back from Charlotte the other day and the car was quiet. It was totally quiet. You know, we weren't really needing to have a conversation and we were just driving. And I started thinking about, you know, imagining what that baby will be doing, you know, babbling or crying or doing whatever. And I just started to smile at that thought, like whatever's going on is going to be interesting. <laughs> that, that's definitely guaranteed. It's going to make our lives a lot more interesting. And that's, I'm excited about that. I really, really am. Now coming full circle to my goals and finally pursuing my goddess book, I'm not giving that up. I'm just making that my highest priority. I want that to be done. I want that off my back. I want that off my plate. I want that, I want that finished before this massive change in our life. And so that gives me a deadline, right? So I have a goal and that is usually all I need <laughs> to get my act together on something. Uh, so I'm going to finish up writing this challenge book. I'm going to finish up pulling these stories together. Uh, I'm going to edit it. I'm going to make that decision whether this deserves to see the light of day or not. And then I'm going to dive right into the goddess book and be working on that too. And I'm super, super excited about it. Now, this does mean that Mally the Maker book two is going to be put on a back burner, not necessarily not going to happen. I'm just saying it is not the number one thing that I'm working on right this second. Uh, and I absolutely plan to still publish Mally book two in 2019. So obviously a lot of time to write. <laughs> the good thing is over this last week, I started writing in the crafty cottage. I have found this actually to be a really, really wonderful place to do my writing. And I was getting into a great flow out here. So I absolutely think that I can get all of this writing done and be able to share all of these stories in 2019. And even if I don't manage to get it all done and published before the baby comes, that's okay. This is the wonderful side of being a self-publisher and running my own business is that it is life on my own terms. And in writing the challenge book, I stumbled across kind of the goal that has been my goal since I was 20 years old. And it's kind of like it's been knocking around in there <laughs> for all this time, but I've never really put it into words until I wrote it down. Uh, and it came from a story when I was dropping out of college and I was kind of digesting through all of that. And I realized my, my goal when I was dropping out of college was to wake up in the morning and work next to Josh and live life on my own terms. And when I wrote that down, I had to stop for a minute and be like, that's still my goal. <laughs> that is still my goal. I, even now at 35 years old, 15 years later, I still wanna do exactly the same thing. I wanna wake up in the morning, I wanna work next to Josh, and I wanna live life on my own terms. So that's what I'm gonna continue to do. 
So that's it for this episode. I hope that you enjoyed hearing about my word of the year, which is embrace change. And you're excited about joining me on this adventure in 2019. Don't forget, you can pick up all of the block patterns for the friendship quilt along and join in the fun as we piece and quilt our blocks every month. And uh, just a quick reminder, we do one block on the home sewing machine and one block on the long arm. So I'm really excited. This was really challenging for me. Uh, I learned a lot quilting on my long arm that I hadn't really expected. So I'm really loving the stretch that the Friendship Quilt Along is giving me. And I can't wait to have a king-sized quilt at the end of it. So I really hope that you enjoyed this podcast episode and that you were excited and pumped up about the changes that are to come in 2019. I think more than anything else, having a positive viewpoint and outlook on life is so, so, so important. Uh, focusing on the negative really gets you nowhere. Uh, and there are so many times in this past year that I could have gotten beaten down and, and, you know, really just let the challenge overwhelm me. And instead I used it as an opportunity to grow and to realize, wow, you know, scary stuff happens and you know what? I live through it and then it's not actually so scary. Uh, it's especially not scary when I have so many awesome people to share it with. So I hope that you enjoyed this episode and I wish you a very, very happy new year until next time. Let's go quilt.